Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, fourth day of, uh, of the course. So today I'll be uh, giving you an introduction to uh, Smart Grid and communication for Smart Grid. So probably this will be less technically or uh, uh, theoretically uh, deep um, than, for instance, yesterday. I guess uh, Telomere's part was, uh, was quite theoretical. Um, I know some of you already are familiar with, uh, with Smart Grid, uh, but I hope that some of you are not too familiar with Smart Grid, that you also get something from this. Um, um, yes, so the first part will be about, yeah, maybe I'll just proceed to, uh, to the agenda for today. Or did I put that the right way? Yep. So the topics we'll go through will be the yeah, what, is, what does the power grid look like today? Then what is the next progression in the smart grid? Uh, what is the typical uh, architectures of communication networks for smart grid? What are the technologies usually uh, employed? And then last uh, thing is a, is a case study um, for a project that I participated uh, in during the, yes, it ended this summer, but then the three and a half years before that, um, about using cellular networks for, uh, for a smart grid uh, system and collecting measurements using that. And we have some results on the communication network performance and, and so on. So at least that would be interesting, even if you know all the other things. Um, then I tried to just uh, copy the time plan from, uh, from Moodle. I don't know if you noticed, I uploaded this yesterday evening. Uh, at least, I know that was the next part for the guys that are not here today. Uh, so this part, uh, so we will, yeah, have some. We'll go through the the presentation I have, uh, the topics I just mentioned, and we'll find a place to to make a break at some point. And then after the lunch break, we will have the the student presentations where some of you will. Uh, present those papers um, that were given on, on Moodle um, and we will have some discussion about those yeah and then there will be cake at some point <laughs> so the power grid of today it says uh, or maybe a few years ago um, Maybe I should mention here that uh, parts of this presentation is based on a book by IEEE that's uh, a few years old now, um, explaining all these things. So, so a lot of this material is from there, and therefore you will probably notice that, especially in relation to communication technologies, some of it is a little bit outdated, uh, even though it's only a few years old, um, and it it has maybe a an American view more than a European view on these things. Um, but, okay, it's pretty. Uh, so so the, the power grid, the traditional power grid uh, is a one-way system, basically where we, you have some different types of power generation capabilities uh, maybe a coal powered power plant, uh, something like that. Then you have transmission network where the power is transported uh, throughout maybe a whole country or throughout Europe. And then you have a distribution network where you actually connect to individual uh, households or industries or commercial sites. Um, and, and then you have the end consumer. What is the main characteristic of this traditional uh, power grid is that there's uh, this one-way flow of power. Like, for instance, in Denmark, we have a lot of wind turbines. So in that case, of course, you can still have this, uh, you could say, topology or, or unidirectional flow if you put all the wind turbines up here. Um, but wind turbines uh, are increasingly being distributed in the grid and and also you will have smaller turbines so, so that actually a, a, a farmer may have a wind turbine on his farm or solar panels or something like this so, this, so you're actually starting to connect um, different um, generation capabilities 
uh, at this level. So this, yeah, this is what uh, is hard to really uh, support in the traditional power grid. So therefore, we need to like rethink this model. <coughs> but coming back to how things work today, there is a graphical illustration here, an example of uh, these different levels. So you have some different uh, generation capabilities up here, then you, where you have a very high voltage, then you connect to the transmission grid with uh, also high voltage, but but not that high. Then you go to a distribution grid where the voltage is uh, lower again, and then finally you have. Um, the individual consumers, and uh, yeah, so you have uh, the way this system works is that it's it's very tightly coupled. That that things are really designed to to fit together, and you need to have uh, like controllable uh, generation up here. That things are predictable, and and you know how things are going. So, uh, in all these cases, you can actually turn them up and increase or decrease the production of uh, electricity. Uh, there's not really any stochastic uh, paths that only comes a little bit down here. But, uh, but all in all, it's, it's very easy to, uh, to adjust uh, uh, so that you, you meet the demand for, for power. Maybe we just take a quick pause. I would like to note down who just arrived. Yeah. So it's. Shall I start? Yeah, I'm Constantino Vigas. NTO view. That uh, is not written as it sounds. So the oh, but I think Constantinos is enough. It's just to find you on the list. Yeah. 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 And your name? I'm, uh, I'm Abdul. Abdul? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay, next. Uh, one more. And uh, welcome. Thank Thanks. And your name? Oh. Uh, Krishna Sami. Yes, um, yeah, so we have these different uh, types of uh, power networks. So the generation part, the transmission part, the distribution part, and then, then we have the individual uh, yeah, consumers, basically. Uh, so, yeah, of course, when you go down, the power lines are becoming uh, smaller and smaller and more and more I would say, fragile, so they cannot carry as much power uh, in, in, in this type of system. Um, yeah, and an important point maybe is that in the distribution subsystem, it's this radial um, topology, so or like a tree-like topology. So, as you see, you we don't really have connections between the different distribution net networks, and uh, this is <coughs> this is something that you would also like to introduce in uh, in future power networks, because that will give you some uh, possibility to supply. If if this substation goes down, then you can supply from a, a different part of the distribution grid, but it, it becomes complicated with power flows and uh, you, you need to have relays and so on. Um, but usually you have this, uh, this type of connection. Um, yeah. So the points around here, so at the higher levels, these are transformers and then at some uh, level you start to call them sub, uh, call it substations, so you are stepping up or down the voltage, but this is also where you have measurement points for what is called the scatter. And scatter is a monitoring system. And 
I believe it's actually a very generic system, but in uh, power engineering, it's used to, to monitor different uh, uh, yeah, would say performance metrics of, of the power network. Um, and this is, uh, I think it's usually like every four seconds as a new measurement. Um, but the measurements are at these points, meaning that you, you don't have measurements from further into the, into the network, so you, you don't actually know what's going on at the individual households. And uh, yeah, I'll come back to this point. You can also up to it. It's kind of the same comments to up to it so far. Um, I think in the industry we can, it's possible, but I don't okay. think there is much reasons they send the <coughs> so with the scatter system, they actuate the I'm Maybe it is a scatter system. I don't know if uh, any of you know that. Uh, the main point of the function of main point of scatter is collect, monitoring, mm -hmm. yeah, actuate by monitoring, mm -hmm. collect, and take action after that. Yeah. The decision making of the smart grid is on scatter. But uh, someone, someone is taking action. Someone is monitoring a man. Uh, or it's like it's and usually you have a control center, right? So there's a guy sitting yeah. and looking at all actually, the data. Actually, uh, the guy who sitting in the scatter main center or something like that, they just, uh, they actually they, they, they don't use anything uh, that important. They just uh, take a look at if there is something, a notification of the warnings or something like that. Actually, uh, the algorithm inside the scatter and the Uh, yeah, I, I think this is uh, this is maybe why I said that this is from a few years ago. Okay. <laughs> because, okay. Um, but yes, it's true. We have this uh, AMI system, so where you are collecting mostly billing information, mm -hmm. and uh, depending on on where you live, it might be uh, only once per month, or on yeah. a daily basis, or down to like every hour. But I, I don't think anywhere they are collecting more frequently. That's the focus of our group. Yes. So, so the, the one with Rasmus? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I think the legislation says you cannot collect data more frequently than every 15 minutes. Yeah, we have the new department working with this. And okay. uh, they are making some new legislation yeah. and new laws. And so the, the companies come to want to implement a new law mm. so that it can be used. Yeah. Yeah, because it will be, it will become very valuable to have this real time information, uh, which is also the, the <laughs> is also the aim of this project that I will, I will uh, or case study that I will present in the, in the end. Yes. Um, in Europe. Um, the power grids are, are actually not on defined as much uh, on a country basis. It's actually also very much on a, a you could say, continent or interconnected countries uh, basis. So there is a synchronization of the frequencies through this whole part of Europe and only taking Jutland and Fiume <coughs> because Sealand is actually connected with Norway, Sweden, and Finland. So they are uh, running on a, an independent frequency. So, so they are not uh, synchronized. It's still 50 hertz, but uh, the, the small offsets are not uh, synchronized. So they are not in? Huh? They are not in work? <laughs> I will not go into that discussion. <laughs> yeah, and then you see there are some uh, smaller parts here that uh, are running their own 
synchronized system. So uh, in the power grid, the things that you uh, you want to do is, of course, you want to supply uh, or you want to balance the supply and demand, so that the pa uh, power generation follows what the consumers will use, um, and also more or less in the places where where it's used. And this ha has to go on continuously and without disruption. Uh, yeah, I, I will also come back to some examples of where it was not non-disruptive, where things uh, had gone wrong and there were some blackouts. <coughs> um, then another um, thing or goal is to, in some cases, learn what is actually the current state of the transmission subsystem. So what is the loading of specific power lines of, and so on. <coughs> because this can be very valuable to know if you need to uh, connect consumers in a different way in the power grid so that you're not overloading specific uh, power lines which can lead to uh, to outages um, yeah you want to counter effect uh, if there is some sudden event um, it could be during a storm that the power line is taken down and you need to have some protection so that this does not spread to the, the whole power grid and of course, uh, long-term planning uh, that you want to foresee where you need to expand uh, the power grid. So maybe putting uh, extra cables in the ground and so on. You cannot do that from one day to the, to the next. So you have to have a, a strategy. And so the last one is not a very dynamic factor. It's the ones up here are like the real-time things you need to uh, to consider. Um, and as we maybe touched upon a little bit, that on top of the, the whole control chain or this, you have the scanner monitoring, then you have some engineers sitting in a control room. And well, I think the use of communications that they uh, have is that they call someone on the phone and say, oh, can you go to this uh, substation and fix uh, this and that? Um, so from a, we would say, the, the grid, high-level grid perspective, there's not that much use of uh, closed-loop solutions. It's, uh, things are working automatic on a, on a lower level, as you say, but this whole grid control is, is not uh, really implemented yet. And it's not really necessary yet, but this is really, really starting to, uh, to come. Yeah, uh, so we talked a little bit about scatter already. Um, so it's, it's mainly on the higher levels that uh, scatter is used. Um, I think also a bit on the distribution level sometimes. Um, but it's... it's uh, present in the places where it's like the most critical points. Um, and basically, I think this is the communication uh, network or the, so you need to deploy a, a five or some cable connections to, uh, to deploy SCADA. So it's also expensive to do. You don't put it everywhere necessarily. And, and you have a quite low number of monitoring nodes. So that was a bit about uh, today's power grid or yesterday's power grid, uh, because we already started to uh, to progress towards the smart grid. A definition of the smart grid is that it's a modernized electrical grid where you use information and communications to act on information, uh, and things are happening in an automated fashion to improve efficiency, reliability, economic sustainability, and so on. Um, so these are the key words, uh, information and communications and automation. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah. So what is uh, why is it we need the smart grid? So this balancing the supply and demand is really a key thing. Um, so that you you can uh, forecast the demand on a shorter uh, time span, um, and you you would like to have real time data from consumers and generators, um, and and this is. This is important now that we are seeing more and more renewable energy sources because things can fluctuate on a much uh, shorter time scale. <coughs> if you have a, a solar panel uh, or a park, a farm of solar panels and then there's a cloud, then suddenly you will see a drop in, in the voltage level or the power level. So these things you need to be able to react on very quickly. Yeah. <coughs> in terms of reliability, um, you need to to collect information <coughs> about the whole power grid. Um, because in yeah, let's take the example of the solar panels again. Then you would need to get power from somewhere else. So you would need to know where you can actually supply supply power from. So be, to be able to actually. Um, have this overview of where is power available in the network and where is uh, a demand in the network is, is crucial. So you need some wide area communications and yeah, and then fast identification of points of faults. So as it is now, things are happening very automatic in substations and transformer stations that if uh, some condition is met, then a relay is, uh, is closing and shutting off uh, a specific part of the of the power grid, so you will have a <coughs> maybe only a a small neighborhood or something is, is cut off, and it prevents this uh, fault to um, what to say to to go into the power grid. Mm. Yeah, control of renewables. Um, yeah. But you have these external factors that can that can actually uh, also play a role, um, and then we see a lot of new uh, paradigms. So uh, we 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 are starting to see electric vehicles. Until the tax was uh, raised on those, um, virtual power plants. Uh, so this is a it's basically a, a concept where you can. Um, you can talk about uh, more or a group of renewables that can actually act as from the outside as a virtual power plant. Uh, so it's not a like a coal powered uh, power plant where you just can control it very simply, but this interaction of the different renewables can actually be used uh, or be seen as a, a virtual power plant. Uh, prosumers is a yeah consumer and producer together meaning that it's a, maybe a, a normal house that has solar panels on the roof and then on a on a sunny summer day if no one is home and no electricity is being used uh, that house will actually be able to sell energy to the grid um, and then when people come home and it's dark then they will buy the power back So that, <coughs> that would be a prosumer. Yeah. Just to, uh, to summarize a slightly different uh, view, so the, the distribution grid of today, if we look at that, uh, then we have the scatter system only down to a transformer station level, meaning that this whole part of the grid, the um, is actually operated blindly, so you don't know exactly what is going on in the different houses. You can you can measure what is uh, what is uh, the use of power up here, but you don't know who is using what uh, uh, until maybe the next day or at the end of the month. Um, so the the utility com companies usually have. Um, 
very good models. Well, that's, I will try to argue on the next slide. So, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> that's also a, a problem uh, with privacy. Yeah. Um, but the, the fact that the sum of consumption of many consumers, so if you have a big neighborhood, then uh, the, the there are quite good models of this aggregate uh, consumption so that you know over the course of a day or if there's a football match in television and so on, then you can actually predict what is the typical pattern of power usage of this whole neighborhood. Um, there you have the, the, and a statistical advantage. But then if you, uh, if you start to see uh, that people have electric vehicles, some have solar, solar panels, and uh, you have uh, smaller wind, wind turbines and so on, then knowing what is going on up here is simply not enough anymore. Um, because you don't necessarily know how many miles did or kilometers did uh, these guys drive this day, so when they plug in the vehicle, then how much does it need to charge? So in, in that case, it's very beneficial to actually have a communication interface with the car, so you know uh, how much power is needed. Uh, you have the photovoltaics, so the, the solar panels that can produce power or not produce power. Um, depending on very local situation of uh, clouds and so on. Um, yeah, and you have the wind factor, so that is why it's argued that you need to know more precisely what is actually going on at this level. Uh, maybe not for all houses, but for a representative sample, uh, you need some more detailed information. Isn't that just because all this concept just starting and we don't have enough statistical information to predict. As you said, we already can predict mm. that there is a football match and the yes. power will grow yes. and skip just because nobody has electric cars yet or not mm -hmm. enough people, we cannot predict this anymore. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the only reason pretty much? Mm -hmm. But you can also argue that looking at the same level, we cannot actually predict how much wind is blowing or how much the skip is going to Well. In principle, if you had weather stations locally deployed, then you could use that information together with the information or the specifications of the car <coughs> and the solar panels and all this. But uh, and then you could have a very elaborate model where you can actually calculate these or estimate these uh, things. But I think maybe in the end, it's it's more accurate to have measurements uh, and maybe also easier if you have some measurement boxes. Um, yeah, so, so this slide is actually from the project that I will explain in the case study in the end. And in that project we were uh, deploying these uh, WAMP nodes, uh, they are called, so Wide Area Monitoring System nodes. Um, in principle, smart meters can also do much of the same type of measurements um, so whether you actually need uh, this WAMS node specifically or you can uh, be satisfied with a, 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 an up-to-date smart meter that's sending data very often, it's, it's almost the same. But the, the key is that you, you want some uh, real-time uh, information being collected. <coughs> yeah. Yes. Um, that's also a very, very good question. And uh, as you say, we don't have enough information, so nobody really knows. <laughs> so uh, in this project uh, I was working on, uh, we collected samples actually with 50 hertz uh, sample rate and transmitted those 50 hertz as well. Uh, but Maybe in reality you only need one sample every second, every 10 seconds, and so it depends a lot on 
how many solar panels and wind turbines and different factors do you have, um, how fast are the loads changing and so on. But I've, I've asked many people this question, what is actually the collection frequency we need? And it's, uh, it's still very uncertain. It depends on what you want to do. something that happened after uh, when the behavior ha happened in the same time, right? And it, uh, uh, in, the, in theory, yes, but in the practically, I guess it's, uh, it's quite uh, far away. So we call it sometimes a near time, near real time. Yeah, <coughs> yeah it, uh, I guess it, it always depends on what is the time scale of your dynam dynamics of the system. Uh, yeah. Can you that uh, this power grid, the distribution system nowadays, it's, it is, uh, how to say, uh, it's more robust than would actually be needed if we have such precise information and the dimension and nowadays the system is over dimension mm -hmm. to support this fluctuation. Exactly. Maybe in the future the infrastructure in the cost of the infrastructure of the system can be reduced if they can predict more precisely. Yes. I mean and the power factor and how to in inject more or less power in the grid from the generator point. Yes, so that's, that's that could be the game the yeah. future but uh, it's still there. But it's a good point that that was actually one of the the goals of this. Uh, there was this distribution system operator in, in this European project, and and they wanted these measurements so that uh, they also knew uh, what what is how much uh, power is, uh, is on the specific lines um, and how close are we to capacity. And then in the future, they, they actually want to be able to, I don't know if they will be controlling exactly uh, what is being fed into the grid, but so you can go really close to the, to the limits, not exceeding. And, and you will be able to do that, or a prerequisite for, being, for, for doing this is that you have very accurate information. Um, because it is very expensive when you need to dig new cables and so on, so it's, uh, it's uh, a, a big goal of theirs. Uh, well, yeah, maybe I can mention already now that another goal was because uh, this was taking, this project or field trial was being done in, in Slovenia, uh, so ex-Yugoslavia, uh, due to the Balkan Wars and all this, a lot of the documentation about uh, wiring had been lost. So they didn't know this cable over here. So we have three phases going from here to here, but which one is, is which? And they really didn't want to go and, uh, and have two guys measuring for all cables. So by deploying these devices that are measuring with a very high frequency, then you can actually identify the phases very easily. Uh, so that, that was one uh, like very specific goal of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so this was basically what we talked about, about going close to the limits, but the DSO, uh, the, the distribution system operator, must always guarantee the, the uh, quality and stability of uh, the supply. So that's why they need these kind of uh, monitoring systems. Um. So now yeah. we'll show a few examples of uh, times when things went wrong. Uh, I guess you, m I don't know if you remember this, uh, there was this blackout <coughs> in the US where Really, a lot of uh, it, w it was a big thing in the, on the news at that time, in 2003. 
Um, yeah, it affected 55 million people in Canada and US, and it costed really a lot of uh, dollars. Um, and the root cause was a, a software bug, so basically alarm, an alarm that was not showing up in the correct way somehow, so the operators were actually not aware that there was this alarm and that they needed to do something uh, manually to redistribute the power after a transmission line had been uh, hit by unpruned foliage. So I guess it's uh, it's a tree that tipped over transmission lines. And because of that, there was a cascade where a local blackout spread to really a lot, uh, so across uh, several states and took down a lot of systems. So, uh, yeah, that is one uh, one example. Then there were, was some incident in Europe uh, where it was not like a tree during a storm that caused this, but actually the it was a storm, but because we started to have so many wind turbines in Northern Europe, then um, this wind power actually changed the, the frequency in the power grid, uh, meaning that, as we saw, since this whole part is interconnected, but then the difference between the, the frequency became too large and, and actually this uh, the, the crash uh, at the Oh, I don't know if it actually crashed, but it uh, it strained the power grid uh, a lot. So I'm not an expert on, on on this, but I don't know if some of you are from energy technology and you know about uh, reactive power and so on. And I, I guess it has to do with that. Um, I don't know if, you, if there is a, a, s a simple explanation. I don't know in this case, but no. if there is a re uh, much reactive power in the power line, and uh, in uh, in different area there is uh, not uh, not equal between reactive power in mm. different area. So uh, some protection really we we have that uh, there is uh, the difference between the frequency and also the voltage, and that will uh, the voltage uh, or over frequency and over voltage relay will act that so if something happened in that area and it will uh, the relay will uh, uh, will open yeah. and, and disconnect yeah disconnect yeah. but with that disconnected the power uh, the power line uh, we can say that the power line uh, the frequency is over again or become decreased and in that sense uh, in such area that uh, relay from the another mm -hmm. area also sense that oh something happened and then as you mentioned that it's a cascade yeah okay <coughs> yeah so so this also shows that uh, when we have a growing penetration of renewable energy resources for instance winter <coughs> then we we really need some, some new countermeasures to cope with this kind of situations. I have a kind of question. In the slides, and the, when you saw the European map before, you said that Sherland is not a part of European, this is a part yes. of Scandinavia. And in this picture, it seems that the, all, all this outage propagates even through Sherland. How well, the hell is this possible? You have to take it off the Japan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, because Sherland mainly connected with uh, mm -hmm. Germany. Should I just go into Sweden from the previous map? Yeah. <laughs> because now, mm. and here is in the same, mm. same part. So maybe it has changed uh, how things are connected? After this did it. After this did Yes. Wait a second, let's do this bigger. <laughs> yeah. I'm just wondering if I actually remember this power outage. There was one time when I was uh, visiting my parents, and then the, yeah. there was a power outage, and uh, Instead of having a, a roast, we had to cut it up and make fondue instead. <laughs> <coughs> and 
finally here is uh, the, the biggest blackout ever, uh, at least until 2012, which happened in, uh, in India. Um, yeah, so the short term cause was a power overload somewhere, but then because there was no not sufficient protection, then this cascaded into a series of failures, taking down really a lot of uh, of the power grid. I guess it it's probably the red regions here that uh, were down, and it affected <coughs> 700 million people. So that's uh, that's a lot. So, what are the obstacles that prevent us, maybe, or uh, not prevent us, from, but uh, make it hard to go to the smart grid? <coughs> um, so, one thing is electrical utilities. When you talk to those and start talking about data communications, but they, do, they don't really see the need uh, because they don't have the need right now. So it's and, and many of them, they, they, they know the power grid very well, the traditional way. Um, and this investing uh, in spe speculative things, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not an easy way to go. Maybe you have also experienced this, or, or maybe you found a, a power company, Mohammed, uh, in, in your project. You, you are cooperating with yeah, two more. Driven by the problem that they are facing because of uh, in Denmark, you know, because of tax cut, there was a growth of PV panels installed around 2010. Oh yes, yes. And it, like the stock was okay. So they they actually and see the need now. Yes. Yes. And now they are facing problems, and they see that the only way to resolve, you know, when these things happen is to change some guy. Yeah. So they need they need uh, this. Increased observability of the uh, system, so they are really interested. Yeah, yeah, because it was a very good uh, investment to buy solar panels yes. for was it one or two years? Exactly. Uh, where you could actually, yeah, you could get the deal that you could sell the power and buy it back at exactly the same price, mm. uh, and uh, also. A, I think you didn't have to pay taxes on or something. Yeah. So many people saw this as a very good uh, investment. And uh, if you have too many people seeing this uh, as a good investment in a, a certain neighborhood, <coughs> and the power lines are not dimensioned for uh, exporting power and taking it back later, then you get problems and you need observability. Yeah. Um, and then the cost of investment, because usually um, the electrical utilities, they think that to get communications, they need to put fiber to some place. Uh, they are not always fond of the idea of sharing resources. Um, and But actually, the, the DSO that we collaborate with in the European project, I'll mention in the end, they, they wanted to try out this using a shared resource, so using LT networks and so on. Um, but I'll come back to that. Um, yeah, and then you could say, uh, so this is not about politics, but this is the engineering challenge or uh, academic challenge that having a closed loop control uh, over the, the grid, you actually have stringent requirements. Uh, so communication latency and uh, reliability and so on. Um, and in the past, communication and computer systems were not really adequate for dealing with this. So if we go back to this very simple graph, then the, the idea of the smart grid is that instead of just having a one-way flow of power, now we can have two-way flow. So power can run both ways.
Um, of course, now I forgot what NIST is actually the acronym. It's National Institute of some American uh, governmental institute that had uh, developed this conceptual model of, of the smart grid. So basically you have uh, some different uh, actors um, in the smart grid. There are different uh, similar uh, overviews um, from, from other sources, but, uh, but this one is quite illustrative. Um, yeah where to start. So if we start from the top of, of this one, the generation, so that would happen out here. Um, the power can be sent to the transmission grid, but when you generate power, there's also an interaction with the markets where you're selling the power and someone is monitoring this and you have the and so in principle you have communication flows that are, that's all the blue ones and while the electrical power is just yeah, flowing between the different levels here um, but then you have all this communication going on and actually I, I want to have you do a, a small exercise around this um, so I, I put some short descriptions of the different parts here. Um, I hope that you can somehow read them or at least you can maybe imagine what what is going on in the different parts based on, on their names. And I would like you to, to uh, use let's say five minutes to discuss maybe two and two or uh, one and one. So in groups of two or maybe three people. Um, so let's consider two use cases uh, one could be the hydro power plant so where you have a water reservoir you can produce electricity on demand by turning on the valve so you have water flowing from a reservoir but of course it takes a bit of time it uh, is not instantly you can just uh, get water and uh, another case is uh, the solar panels by uh, a customer so a house where you have solar panels on the roof and yeah, produces electricity when the sun shines and you can either use it in the house or feed it into the distribution grid. So I would like you to discuss then these, uh, these two use cases in relation to the different actors. So how uh, does the, the hydropower plant uh, what kind of interactions is triggered uh, in that case? So if you if you can you spend five minutes discussing this also for the solar panel case, and then uh, then we will try to maybe take a few uh, of your outcomes and discuss afterwards. Okay, so maybe just two and two, or two. <laughs> Not two and two, one and one, or oh, one and two. And I managed to have a, a late breakfast in between. Um, probably it will take too much time to col collect your discussions from everyone. But uh, near, near time. Near, near time. <laughs> so do, do you have something that is, uh, did, did you consider or discuss something where you really think uh, here we need real time communication? <laughs> <laughs> any uh, any examples you came across? I personally uh, think that uh, the internal vaccines is not useful in transmission and generation part. Why? Because uh, there are lots of uh, challenges with the internal vaccines should be faced. And uh, for example, as I told my colleagues, uh, for example, if a fault happened in a transmission line, the relay will send, uh, sense it and send a command to breakers. And the breakers will automatically disconnect the line. Yeah. And recloser will connect it, uh, the line several times to find out if the uh, fault is 
And imagine that a wireless network here is used. Okay. There's going to be a packet loss, as I saw these days, during a couple of days ago. And uh, delays, many things uh, using a, a wireless communication system should be tackled. Mm -hmm. And what's the point of using uh, this kind of communication system? Well, you don't have to. Uh Deploy fiber necessarily, uh, but yeah, it's true. Okay, I so but uh, there is a still uh, there is an existing uh, fundamentals. Mm. Yeah, I can see any point. And uh, I, I think you're probably right that uh, that at this point in time, on the higher levels, it doesn't really make sense to to use IoT technologies. But as you get closer to the customer, then it makes more sense. Yeah. And this is also something we'll discuss later today. But uh, yeah, th this um, procedure you described with uh, the relays and so on, yeah. there you're talking few milliseconds, right? Yes, exactly. exactly. And they sense it uh, directly by CDMPT, you know, current transformer. Mm. They sense it yeah. locally, and they find it if there's a call for us. Yeah. They don't use any communication here. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't make sense now. Because they don't need any communication. Mm. They just need to know if there's a call for us. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yes. Um. <laughs> any other? Uh, Examples or things you where you thought that maybe here you need real time communications. Yes, yeah, for uh, renewable energy sources, mm -hmm. probably it's a good solution because they're more predictable, mm -hmm. more dynamic, uh, mm -hmm. and they also affect uh, actually the market mm -hmm. and uh, and they affect also the um, the balance between demand and supply. So. In a way that uh, never happened before, mm. because that's not many other sources. So actually, for me, that's the main problem. Uh, that's the that will be the focus of uh, new communication technologies, real time. Mm. Yes. Uh, correlated with the uh, realities, when the huge amount of electricity hacker and the electricity hacker can. frequency stability by aggregating them into some point to balance the frequency. Mm. So um, a lot of clubs, right? So they need to interact each other and the aggregators by the some you know heterogeneous communication uh, collect database uh, collect data and database each of them who's the car that uh, suitable to, uh, suitable to uh, react as uh, stability, uh, frequency stability. So you're mm -hmm. taking adva advantage of a connected battery to exactly. the grid. Yeah. Yes. So when the car is parked and mm -hmm. connected, then yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. Okay. I think we will uh, move on. <coughs> um, so the the vision about smart grid is that. You could say instead of just focusing on power engineering and control as it was done in the past, now we are really also uh, taking into account uh, new disciplines like uh, signal processing and communications. And especially the communications is, um, is very important, you can say, or it, uh, it appears many places. So you have uh, power engineering interactions with the um, with the power grid, you need to communicate something, some measurements, do signal processing, which you feed into a control algorithm. Then you communicate back the control action to the power system, and and this way it, uh, it continues. In principle, you could also have the need for communications here after the signal processing if the controller is running some some different place. So so communications is really what ties. Uh, the whole thing together. <coughs> uh, 
Um, then there are some uh, objectives uh, of smart grid for, from different points of view. Um, so there are some national objectives, there are some consumer objectives, and some utility objectives. Um, now you just had a five minutes discussion, so maybe it's too much to uh, to spend time on discussing again. But uh, um, I think a good question to ask uh, is whether these objectives are actually complementary, complementary, or they are conflicting. Um, and I think in many cases they are actually complementary. So, for example, the steady availability of power. Uh, from a national point of view goes in line with the consumer objective of power quality and reliability and, and also the utility objectives of, of improved stability. Um, so can any of you spot some objectives that are actually con conflicting? <coughs> I was wondering. Uh, yeah. Yes? Reduce investment in new generation assets on the one hand, uh -huh. and on the other hand, reduce dependence on fossil fuels, which means investment for renewable energy, etc., which might not necessarily be low cost, right? Yeah. So we want to replace one energy source with some other, yeah. and there's no guarantee that there will not be such a substantial investment cost. So these two might be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you know at the first glance, there might be contradiction. Yes. You, yeah, and, and this can affect the reliability if you, yeah, if you are not investing as much in generation and, yeah. and really, yeah, affects stability. Yeah. Okay. Um. So now I will talk a little bit about the architecture of smart grid communication networks. And I think we can get started on this before the break. Um, so we saw this picture before, where we had uh, the generation, transmission, and distribution. And now we have zoomed in on the distribution part. Um, because as you say, this is maybe where we can benefit from having wireless technologies. Um, and let's look at some different segments. Um, so, so you can talk about some different uh, types of networks. Uh, the wide area network, which is usually used uh, in this uh, part where you have the generation, um, but it's not always like that, because actually in the in the project uh, case study I will show in the end, we used a type of wide area network also for uh, to cover um, down at the consumer level. <coughs> but um, yeah, these are the like typical definitions. But on, on this uh, consumer level, you have what is called the neighborhood area network. Um, and then on individual homes or uh, buildings, you have a, a home area network. And you could say the, the similar thing on the, on the uh, generation side, um, maybe for a wind farm, is what is called a field area network. So these two are more or less uh, comparable, or you, you have, the f depending on the size of uh, a wind farm, then it uh, the properties are somewhere in between home area network and neighborhood area network. Um, yeah, so IEEE, uh, they have this uh, standard for smart grid networks. They call it two, uh, 2030. Um, and this division into the, these types of networks uh, is uh, coined by, by them, you could say. Of course, we know wide area network, and these are known from uh, 
when you talk about communication systems, um, yeah, and you have for each of these types of network, you have different uh, coverage areas, you have different application requirements and technologies. So um, I will try to go rather quickly through these different types uh, because probably um, the properties more or less explain them or are given from, from this type of uh, network and, and also we discussed already what are some of the requirements of uh, generation and, and so on. But the, the wide area network, large areas uh, and expensive equipment, you need reliable links and it's typically wired uh, and, and you need something that's stable. For the neighborhood area network, um, you have some smaller clusters maybe of, uh, of similar uh, homes, you could say. Um, and, and this is one place where you typically have some wireless technologies. Uh, then you have the field area network, which is typically utility owned. Um, so that maybe gives some, some different uh, challenges. Then you have the home area network, <coughs> where the purpose is to uh, to connect devices within a home, and this is uh, also typically wireless, but could also be uh, based on PLC, uh, power line communications. Yeah. yeah so one maybe important to emphasize is uh, the security part here because. In homes, we so using cheap Wi-Fi networks and so on. Uh, maybe something extra is needed to make things secure, and and maybe also this part about privacy, that someone uh, passing by your house cannot actually uh, find find out a lot about you just from hacking into your wireless uh, your your Wi-Fi network, so that uh, maybe this uh, sensitive data about your consumption or uh, data uh, exchange from your smart meter and so on, but that it's not uh, too easy to get hold of. <coughs> I think this relates again to uh, if you use standard Wi-Fi access points, then quality of services may be difficult to, uh, to ensure. Or if you are relying on a, um, I don't know, a DSL connection or something, it's ah. not. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Huh? Yeah, if it's a shared, yeah. <coughs> and maybe also just relating to these technologies that are that are running in uh, shared spectrum. Usually, it's this uh, open 2.4 gigahertz, right? Uh, so. Ensuring quality of service in that case can be challenging. Yeah. And then this IQ for the spec that you mentioned. Does it uh, uh, does it tie to specific IQ for e technologies for, for communication or um or is it just like architecture level? Yeah, it's uh, uh, there's actually a yeah, very expensive book. <laughs> published by Atribly of a thousand pages or something like that. That's re that really goes through uh, yeah, what is the power grid today and explaining everything, uh, how is the smart grid uh, expected to look and uh, yeah, it, it is what most of this presentation is based on. Uh, outlook on the, <coughs> yeah, the wireless technologies that they expect will be dominant in, in the smart grid. Um, but I, I think that probably something like NB IoT, which has only recently gotten its real name and been specified and so on, it's, it's not considered specifically, but maybe indirectly. Uh, I also have a slide where, uh, so like the, 
you could say, the, the outlook to the future smart grid uh, communication technologies is also given. Is it the whole term of IoT should be wireless, or some part uh, there is a wire, and some part wireless? Hmm. I don't think that uh, that wired is uh, forbidden or anything, but it's it's just that many things are mobile and. Mm -hmm. So it's quite natural that you have uh, wireless. So it is, it is like the first paragraph of the paper I have to present, and I said it like this. Nothing, as you said, nothing prevents IoT to be wired, but the term IoT was invented mm -hmm. to make to be wireless, actually. To make a wireless. I see. Like, at the beginning, everything was wired, but nobody was talking about IoT. Mm -hmm. When people start talking about <laughs> IoT, they assume it's wireless, even though it's and probably IoT is one of these hype or buzzwords that that will fade away uh, in in some years, mm -hmm. maybe, and and then people will start to call it something else. Uh, yeah. In general, when, when we are talking about <coughs> the wireless networks, mm -hmm. doesn't this doesn't mean that every part of the network is okay. wireless? Even in cellular telephony. But for is open optical fibers. Mm -hmm. This doesn't make the, the mm -hmm. cellular network a wired network. Mm -hmm. It's not wireless because mm -hmm. the access is wireless when you have mobile communication. The backbone itself. Yeah, but, but the backbone itself open is optical fiber. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be end to end wireless to label it as a wireless. Yeah. But if you are in a place where you can connect directly to a, like a fiber link, then of course it will give you uh, your thing a better <laughs> connection as long as it can remain static. <coughs> um. Well, we have a very long fiber. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> mm. But is a fiber actually a wire? It's not copper. Yeah. <laughs> and if you can connect the fiber, you also can connect the power source. And then it's so pretty much all of the assumptions about IoT are really <laughs> <long gone. laughs> Because you already have power and you can do yes, it. I read that uh, the concept of smart city also that uh, they will produce a lot of uh, spots that but uh, the main core of the spot is a uh, wire network which is uh, fiber optic hmm. but they create a lot of spot with the hot spots or spot spot for a uh, for a connection I mean for interconnection with the wireless hmm. Okay. That's yeah. one of the uh, concept of the smart cities. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, uh, <coughs> especially in Denmark, the utility <coughs> companies have also been quite smart at putting down fibers when they're digging down cables for, for power. Uh, for instance, where I live, which is a quite rural, uh, we have a, a fiber connection for internet, which is very nice. and. <laughs> A bit funny that then people living in Norfolk cannot get the same. <laughs> they, they have to rely on stove or some cable or TV or something else. Uh, so the, yeah, that's uh, that was quite uh, well forecasted by them. Um, yeah. <laughs> then at the generation and distribution level, if we look at the other part of this figure. Uh, it is typically wired uh, connectivity. So some well-known, well-established technologies, um, less IoT-ish, I guess, uh, fiber, cable connection, maybe DSL, and, and uh, some traditional uh, wired links, uh, very high speed usually. So, uh, the next part will actually be about uh, the different applications or services in, in the smart grid. Um, I think maybe I'll just, uh, yeah, just quickly 
mention them and try to categorize them and then we, we can have the break. Um, so maybe one of the most important ones is this wide area situational awareness, which is yeah what we have discussed earlier also, that you monitor and maybe also to some extent control across a, a very wide area of the, the power grid. Um, so that you can account for renewable energy uh, generation and, and all these things that we actually uh, talked about. So you can have uh, the overview of the grid and, and maybe do some control actions in uh, different places. Um, Down here. Yeah. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I, I believe I have a more detailed slide. Uh, well. Yeah, it's here. Uh, so it's. Uh, Passive infrastructure would be transmission lines and cables and so on. So to uh, to maybe have sensors different places. But uh, yeah, we can come back to that later. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, so there are some some different applications. So this is uh, wide area situational awareness. There is some distributed e energy resources and storages so for instance electric vehicles would be one type of storage uh, or, or batteries uh, deployed in the grid um, fault detection and so on well and this would usually be connected in this wide area network uh, fashion then we had that uh, about this um, about monitoring basically the equipment field area network um, then in the neighborhood we have this AMI we also touched on shortly about uh, tracking consumption so that bills can be uh, written alarms and outages so detecting if if a household does not have power for instance uh, demand response um, electric vehicles so there is something about smart charging and offering storage capacity and so okay so uh, this also falls under this network but the information might be useful up here in the situational uh, awareness as well and then finally on the home area network side we have uh, also a part of this balancing supply demand but within the home um, so it yeah one part is just tracking consumption but also adapting like activation schedules for instance you can run your dishwasher during the night uh, where usually there's a surplus of power especially if it's windy uh, and and then um, then you help to balance out the, the, the grid demand supply. Um, of course, right now, the price is still the same uh, in Denmark, but I think that from next year, there will be some trials where people will actually, um, they will be paying on a much shorter time scale for their electricity, so the price will be varying. Uh, and this will be rolled, uh, rolled out to some customers. Um, I think some places, is it true that, that now it's uh, already you can have hourly uh, like accounting of, uh, of electricity? Any of you know that? Uh, or if it's... Uh, you mean dynamic price based on the... Yeah, for the individual consumer or prosumer. I think uh, it's not public <coughs> yet. No. But it's going to be public in 2019. Yeah. Yes. So that the timescales will become 
shorter and shorter and actually the fact that you are careful about when you spend the power you can actually save on that uh, now uh, if you have to do that manually it becomes a bit tiresome mm -hmm. I know there was a project on the, this island in Denmark Bonholm mm -hmm. uh, where some people had this uh, thing installed on the wall where they could see the current consumption and what was uh, the price of power and so on and, and that actually made them more aware of hands. when they use power. Some, some, some from the hands, from energy management. Yes, yes, exactly. <coughs> and uh, this is something we will see more in the, in the coming years. But uh, let's have a break now uh, before we proceed. Now, of course, I don't remember how long was it scheduled. 15 minutes? Yeah. Let's yeah. so see a quarter to 11. Yeah. Oh.